Hey everyone, it's Dino again. Uh, this video will consist of questions uh, 21 to 30. So this is the third set of uh, questions I'm gonna do for you. Let's just uh, jump right in into the PowerPoint. Okay, question number 21. The insured has an OAP-1 with a $300 deductible on comprehensive coverage, which is kind of normal. A cigarette set the car seat on fire, causing $500 damage. How much will the insurance company pay? So there are a couple of things going on here. What they're testing in this question is, what kind of coverage we are talking about, what kind of peril that affected the car, which is fire. Okay, so you may have heard that the insurance companies, they usually don't charge a deductible for fire loss. And you must be also familiar with OPC of 40, OPC of 40, which says that the insurance companies now, they are going to charge a deductible for fire loss. Okay, but the question doesn't talk about the OPC of 40 and uh, if they're going to charge a fire uh, deductible, then it should say that the policy has an OPC of 40. It doesn't say that. So with that in mind, just uh, let's go back to this. A cigarette set the car on fire. I mean, seat, just a seat. It's not the total car causing $500 damage. How much will the insurance company pay? Now, I'm going to go with uh, uh, the, the $500 um, dollar option here because... If it's a fire loss, they shouldn't use the deductible unless there is an OPC of 40 on the policy. This is my take on that. So I'm gonna go with the A, okay? So it should be uh, fully paid. And uh, question number 22, the insured's auto has been damaged while parked in a dimly lit parking lot at a hockey arena by someone who dabbled paint over it. Oh, okay. So somebody double paint over it, maybe it's vandalized. So the official term that we have to use here for coverage purposes is vandalism because double paint over it, okay? So the insurance collision and specified peril coverage, uh, we have a problem right there. So the, the vandalism has nothing to do with the collision, but the specified peril, see they are testing you here if you know the difference between specified perils and comprehensive coverage. So what the difference? Specified peril is a number of, you know, fire, theft, and all of that. But then it doesn't include vandalism, but comprehensive includes vandalism, falling object, you know, like uh, missiles and vandalism, falling object, uh, windshield damage, you know, those kind of things are covered under comprehensive. So we added a few coverages to specified perils and we call them now comprehensive. And one of them we added is vandalism. Okay, so with that in mind, let's just go and look at the options. So like I said in the previous video, I think uh, before you get to the uh, options, if you can just do a little analysis and be prepared when you go through the answers, you you more likely, uh, uh, you know, you are able to find the better answer. So the insurer will pay the loss less the deductible under specified peril. I don't think that's the right answer because specified peril does not have vandalism. The insurer will pay the loss less the deductible under collision? No, because this is vandalism. It has got nothing to do with the collision. The insurer will pay the loss without a deductible under specified peril. Doesn't make any sense to me because first of all, if there's a deductible, they will use the deductible unless it's a fire loss or something, right? Uh, under specified peril, we already said for option number A that there is no vandalism including specified peril. So the for D option, there is no coverage for this loss, which is correct because specified peril doesn't include vandalism. So I'm gonna go with the D. So your insured owns two vehicles Registered under insured, uh, registered and insured under OAP one. Vehicle one carries collision as well as comprehensive, so it does full coverage. On vehicle number two, he carries only comprehensive. 
he buys a third vehicle on the weekend without having contacted his insurance company. Okay, so I know where this question is going. I can tell you right away, the customer bought a car during the weekend and many customers have this misnomer, the misunderstanding that they are covered for 14 days automatically. Yes, that is true, but it's only the half truth. It's not the full truth. So if you're listening to this as a broker, I'm gonna explain this. This is very important. Many customers are making this mistake. They heard this from somebody. Oh, you know, don't worry about it. Uh, you can pick up a car and you don't have to call your company up to 14 days and they should, they should still cover it. It's not that simple. There are conditions. And one of the conditions of the big one is, let's say your customer has four vehicles insured with the company, okay? And then one vehicle has only mandatory coverage. It doesn't have collision comp because an older vehicle. So he removed the uh, collision and comprehensive just as the mandatory coverage. And now he, on the weekend, he goes and buys a car, a new car. And so he, he wrecks the car. He has an accident and he hasn't even called the insurance company, which is a big mistake. He will only get the coverage from the car, which has the least coverage on the policy on his existing vehicle. So in my example, he's not going to get any coverage because the least coverage on one of the vehicles, which is already on the policy, it doesn't have full coverage. It's a big, big problem. So you have to tell your customer, Mr. Customer, there are conditions you may or may not be covered. The best thing is before you start driving your car, call us. If you're going to pick up the car on, on a Saturday or Sunday on the weekend, call us before we close on Friday. You have to have like a temporary library certificate, like a confirmation of coverage in your wallet to be before uh, you start driving the car. And so don't take it on the weekend. Okay, because it has lots of issues. So with that background in mind, let's read the question. So he had a, co a collision on the weekend. What is the situation under the policy regarding the loss? Okay, there's full coverage as both vehicles are insured with the same insurer. Well, we're talking about a third vehicle. Okay, yes, two vehicles are insured with the same insurer. That doesn't automatically extend the coverage to the new car. He is covered because he had 14 days to notify the insurer. So this is what the most of the customer think that they have 14 days to notify the insurer, which is partially correct. He has no collision coverage on the new third vehicle. Now, I'm gonna go with that. I'm gonna go with that, but we're gonna read the, the last option, okay? He is covered because he has 14 days to notify the insurer. All vehicles are insured with the same insurer and vehicle number one carried collision coverage. Yes, vehicle number one carried collision coverage, but what about vehicle number two? So because the law of the insurance company they follow is that they're gonna look at the, the vehicle with the least coverage on the existing vehicle, which is vehicle number two, because only as comprehensive, and he had a collision. So they're gonna apply vehicle number two, which has the least coverage. So he will not have collision coverage. This, this is very serious guys, okay? This is very serious, okay? So uh, especially if it's a new car and then people don't know this. This is why brokers should explain to the customer. So I'm gonna go with, um, with C, okay? Next question. In the event of a theft, how quickly must the insured notify the insurer? Well, again, they're playing with the numbers here, okay? So you need to know the number to answer the question. I know it's within seven days, okay? There's no point in taking looking at the 72, 42 hours of promptly, it's very subjective. But yes, there are seven days time limit they have to call. Or what if during the theft, the customer was hurt by the thief, okay? There was some kind of altercation. And then so he's in a hospital now. It could happen. So within seven days, or if unable, because of you know whatever the issue they went through, to do so as soon as possible. I'll go with that. It's definitely more likely is D. So the insured for reasons of his own, sold his auto and contacts you by phone as to what should be done about his OAP policy. So he has no longer the car, so he's calling you. You should advise the following. Send the insured a cancellation for uh, or a lost policy cancellation form 
or a lost policy voucher is usually included with the policy, instructing him to insert the effective cancellation date, which is correct, sign it and return it to the to your office. Yeah, absolutely correct. For a pro rata refund, that is wrong. There are two types of cancellation. One is a short rate based, and the other one is pro rata. The pro rata is when the insurance company decides to cancel the policy. They have to return the premium, whatever is unearned. I'll give you a quick example. You're insuring a Honda Civic for $2,000 a year for 12 months. Okay, the customer calls after six months. Uh, uh, or in this case, let's, let's use the example of the insurance company cancels because the pro rata is insurance company cancellation. So the insurance company they want to cancel the policy after six months because they found out that the insured made a lot of modifications and they did some kind of illegal racing or whatever it is. They found out that he has been doing something very bad to the vehicle. He didn't inform them. So they decided to cancel after six months. So in my example, if they took $2,000 for the whole year, even though they are canceling the policy for a good reason, they have to return in proportion to the number of days that they had the policy the return premium. That means in my example, they have to return $1,000. Okay, they cannot keep any extra money because insurance company, they decided to cancel. This is the government rule. B, tell them the premiums due to the sale of the car is fully earned and he can discard the policy. No, it's not fully earned because he says here, um, he sold his auto and contacts you by phone as to, it doesn't say at the end of the policy he sold it. We have to assume that it's sometime in the middle of the policy, he sold the car and then he is calling you to cancel the policy. So this is only possible that the premium is fully earned when the policy come to the 12 month period. It doesn't say that here. C, send the insured a cancellation form or loss policy voucher or ask him to sign of the policy with the effective of cancellation and return it to your office to be passed along to the insurer for a short rate refund of the unearned premium. This is correct. What the short rate? When the insured decide to cancel the policy, which is happening in this example. So the insurance company, they, they should cancel the policy. They cannot say no, but then they're gonna keep a small uh, amount. We don't call them penalty. It, customers don't like that. It's called a short rate cancellation fee, okay? Because the insured decide to cancel the policy. So the C is the correct answer. It's correctly worded, okay? So 25 is the C. So which of the following are the compulsory automobile insurance plan that involves both the government and private insurers? Well, I know this because Immediately, you can think of only one province that has this, government and private. It's Quebec. Quebec is the only province with very unique insurance which no other province practices. So what they do in Quebec, any bodily injury claim will be directly handled by the government of Quebec. They have something called SACQ. It's, it's actually a French acronym. So that government outfit will take care of everything for the customer, for the injured person. Rehab, medical, whatever you're talking about, okay? So this government provides. But then they gave to the private industry fixing the car, the physical damage to the car. So it's a combination, it's a dual system in Quebec. So the answer is very clear. You have to know this because I've seen this question in the previous exams. And so that's D. With respect to a liability claim arising from an automobile accident, so obviously we're talking about some kind of bodily injury happened, so the other party who got injured is suing the, the driver, which of the following must prove the link between the fault and the damage? So someone is blaming someone else that that other person caused them bodily injury. In a court of law, in the legal jurisprudence, this person will be called a plaintiff, the one who is accusing another person of having caused the damage. The one who says, I am now at a loss. I've been hurt. So that person is legally called a plaintiff. Okay. Yes, in a free country, you have the right to accuse somebody. 
but you also have the burden of proof. It's also known as the onus of proof. So in the legal system, in the normal course of things, the burden of proof to, to prove that there was a link between the fault and the damage should be uh, proven in the court by the plaintiff. They have the burden of proof because they are the one accusing someone else of having done something. And the judge says, okay, I understand, but can you prove it? Because, you know, you can just make a frivolous uh, lawsuit against somebody just to make some money. So the law says that, okay, can you prove it? And we'll, we'll you know, we'll look at your proof. So I'm going with C, plaintiff has the burden of proof or the onus of proof. With respect to automobile insurance, subrogation rights. So what's a subrogation? Your insurance company has paid you the loss and then they are going after the person who was actually, who actually caused the loss, who was negligent. So that's called the subrogation. So if we take Ontario, for example, there's no subrogation rights allowed because we follow DCPD. So DCPD says everybody will go to their own company and get compensated to the extent they are not at fault by DCPD. And to the extent they are at fault, their collision or all pills will cover coverage will pick it up. But for not at fault, you don't have to go after the other driver. You go to your own company and tell them your story and they'll use the fault determination rules. And if you're not at fault in the accident, they will pay and they will not subrogate. Okay, so that, that's what happened in DCPD. So let's say the question here with respect to automobile insurance, subrogation rights uh, do not exist. So we are looking at, the, uh, I, I don't like this, just a simple statement, do not exist. Although I just said a minute ago that you cannot go, your company cannot go and subrogate against the other party, but there are some situations, like for example, the other party was drinking and driving under the influence, he was impaired, then he caused you, then the insurance company will pay you and then they have a subrogation right to go after him because he did something criminal. So we're not going to give him a pass. So you cannot just say do not exist for everything. There are some exceptions. Um, may be limited or removed by federal federal legislation. I don't think so because the federal government, they don't involve in the auto insurance. Okay, if you want to get a license to operate uh, in many provinces, yes, you can go to the feds and they give you a license and everything and there's a whole process, okay? Yeah, but not in just, you know, the automobile underwriting, subrogation, okay? It's, it's at a provincial level, okay? C, exist only if the insured gives written authorization to the insurer. There's nothing like that. There's no such thing as written authorization to the insurer at the time of a claim is paid. No, even if you give a written authorization to your insure, uh, insurance company, normally they don't have any subrogation rights in Ontario, except as you said, if it's a, like a criminal negligence, yes. Okay, so you can give written authorization, but it's not gonna work. So then we are left with the D. Subrogation rights may be limited may be limited or removed by provincial legislation, which is very true. So the province looking at the situation, maybe it will become a lawsuit, okay? And then the insurance company is going to go after that person because they uh, criminally, they did something wrong. Uh, so insurance company is trying to exercise their right, but then it can, it can be contested in the court uh, or there could be legislation by which the subrogation rights could be removed. It's possible, okay? So that seems to be the right answer for me, okay? So I'll go with D. Just a couple of more questions. Absolute liability is just one of the most important things you need to know, okay? Absolute liability, uh, you absolutely have to know, no pun intended, okay? <laughs> so it implies, okay, so before we get to this answer, I'll give you a quick example, uh, a quick analysis. Let's say uh, one of the customers, uh, he uh, did some illegal racing on a Friday night. You know, they had illegal racing and then he caused bodily injury to some spectators. Okay, watching this race. Now, the insurance company has all the right to deny the claim whatsoever. 
because what he did was completely wrong. It's an exclusion. No like speed test or illegal racing is allowed. But what are you gonna do with the innocent third party who are just a spectator there? Are you gonna just leave that person? No. So we have law in place to protect the innocent third party. It is called absolute liability. So the, the law makes the insurance company absolutely liable to take care of the innocent third party. And after they've done that, given everything the third party needs for them to get up and going, then they can go after their client who caused this whole mess and they can actually subrogate against them for all the damages. But they have to, by virtue of the absolute liability, they have to take care of this innocent party first. So with that in mind, that's how absolute liability, that's the definition of absolute liability. So let me see if my explanation has one of the choices here, okay? So all liability claims resulting from an automobile accident are settled on a 50-50 basis? No. It's not that you're always on a 50-50 basis, okay? No, that's totally wrong. The insurer must pay the third party damages regardless of the amount involved. No. So with, the, with regard to the amount, because the insurance company is forced to pay this, so they will have, they will go up to the minimum limit set by the jurisdiction. Let's say in Ontario is $200,000 is the minimum limit for third party liability. And so they will go maximum to that extent, okay? And see, the insurance must pay the third party damage up to the actual limits of the policy. No. So the actual limits, if you look at the any Ontario policy, is 1 million third party liability. Okay. Uh, even if the insured violated a policy condition. So in my example, yes, he did violate the condition. Uh, but then the actual limit of the policy, I have a problem with that. Okay. Limit of the policy, they, they'll only go to the minimum. D. The insurer must pay the third party damage up to the minimum limits of the jurisdiction in question. And if the insured violated the policy, even if the insured violated the policy condition, this is correct. The D is correct. Okay. They should pay under absolute liability, but up to the minimum limits in Ontario is 200,000. So I'm going to go with the D. Final question. With respect to automobile insurance, no fault insurance means. So what's the definition of no fault? In order to avoid frequent lawsuits, some of the provinces implemented no fault insurance. So basically what it means is when an accident happens, regardless of who is at fault, let's go to our own companies and deal with them and tell the story and they're going to use the fault determination rules and then they're going to tell you that you were 100% at fault, 100% not at fault, or you were 50-50, 50% at fault, 50% not at fault. So you're not dealing, you're not going up to the other party to pay you or to, to get, you know treat you for the injuries or whatever. It's gonna be so difficult. So that's kind of the general definition of no fault insurance, okay? It's very uh, different or opposite to tort system. In a tort system, it's very adversarial. What's adversarial? You have to go after the other party to get compensated. But in many provinces, they implemented no fault, okay? So let's see the, the definition, the choices here. A strict tort system of compensation. No, this is the opposite. <laughs> so the tort system is the opposite of no fault. This has a lot of problem because you have to go after the other party who caused the damage to get collected. Minimum limits under the third party liability coverage? No, we're not talking about the limits. We are talking about a method of indemnifying the insured, whether it's tort or no fault. We're not talking the limits here, okay? That all automobile coverage are sold by the government? No. Okay, the government sells the policies in three provinces BC, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. And so that all automobile policy are sold by the government? No, there's no such thing. Then let's say the D, that legislation has been passed prohibiting or severely limiting lawsuits for injuries. That is right. Although it is kind of a, like a little convoluted answer, but I would go with that. Why? 
because what the meaning of no fault insurance? Remember I said in the beginning that people are just suing each other under the tort system and it takes so long and then so much frustration and everything. Then they introduce some of the problems and no fault. Just deal with your own company and tell them the story and let them decide. And they will protect you up to, uh, to the extent you're not at fault. Okay, uh, no fault insurance. And they will give you the medical benefit and all of that from your own policy based on like a no fault concept. Okay, so this way, it actually prohibited or lessened uh, the lawsuits for injuries. That's exactly the objective of no-fault insurance. The advent of no-fault insurance was triggered because of this. This is the objective, to prohibit or severely at least to limit. So people are free to sue others, okay? But when you're able to go to your own company and get compensated without any hassle, okay, then why would you... Uh, uh, make a lawsuit, get a lawyer and pay them by the hour and everything. And then you you make a lawsuit. So this no fault, it's true historically, it limited or severely uh, limited or prohibited uh, the uh, lawsuits. That is very true. So I'm going to go with D. So thank you everyone uh, for the segment. So I'm going to just say uh, goodbye for now until our next video.